Thank you. Good day, friends, and welcome to Rack Hospital and Arise UAE webinar series on post-COVID. So this is our 17th webinar, and our topic uh, is children and COVID. Uh, now, first, let me welcome our first speaker for today, that is Dr. Vishal R. Mehta. So Dr. Vishal R. Mehta is our senior specialist pediatrics at Rack Hospital. Uh, to give a brief introduction about Dr. Vishal, Dr. Vishal has achieved his MBBS in 2002 from Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Belgaum, India. In 2006, he obtained his MD in Medi Pediatrics from prestigious postgraduate uh, Institute of Medical Registration and Research, that is Chandigarh, India. His expertise uh, over the 19 years in pediatric and neonatology is uh, very commendable and he has worked in reputed institutions across India, like uh, PGIMR, Chandigarh, Tata Memorial Hospital in Pediatric Oncology, in GS Medical College, Dilawati Hospital, Fortis uh, Hospital as a Pediatric Intensivist, Serum Institute as Assistant Director, Vaccine Research and Medical Affairs. He joined RAC Hospital in 2010, and he is profoundly liked by all his pediatric patients and he's very famous among his little patients. He is a pediatric advanced life support program instructor from AHA and ASHI, and also PALS and NRP and BLS provider. His special interest is in pediatric intensive care. So he also speaks Hindi, English, and Urdu. So may I request Dr. Vishal to start? Yeah. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Vishal, and today I will be talking regarding children and uh, COVID-19. Uh, can, can you see my screen, all of you, please? Yes, Doc. Yeah, uh, let me proceed then. Okay, now COVID-19 has been there for past two years and a lot of buzz, a lot of new things we have been learning about Corona. Uh, it all started with, uh, you know, initial wearing masks, sanitizing yourself, uh, having COVID appropriate behavior, mitigation methods, social distancing, everything we learned new in our life. Then came the second wave where there was more number of cases, the shortage of oxygen, how to provide oxygen support, how the health system has to be prepared. And later on, there was a COVID vaccine, the advantages, the disadvantages, the vaccine hesitancy, everything has been in discussion. Uh, this concern regarding third waves and in third wave, the concern regarding whether there would be more number of children getting affected by coronavirus infection when the third wave comes. Well, I'm today gonna to talk about pediatric. We have talked a lot about Corona, so I'm gonna be very specific about children and Corona. So let me take today's discussion in the form of uh, question and answers. So we will ask certain questions regarding the myths and the facts about the Corona and the children. And we are gonna look into the facts what are available and try to answer those questions today. Now, the first question we have is, are children safe and would they not get Corona infection? 
let's look at the data what is available with us. Now, let me start with the data which is available for pediatric and adolescent case in India. Uh, the data which was collected from March 2020 onwards, and we can see the age distribution of COVID-19 cases in a pie chart. So we can see that the children below 20, uh, 0 to 20 years age accounts for almost 12% of cases. Similar data was also published by uh, CDC in US population among the reported cases of COVID-19 infection, 14% of cases belong to pediatric age group that is below 18 years age. Now, we can also note that although the number of cases are there in the pediatric age group, but compared to the proportion of the population of pediatrics, uh, it is significantly less. So for example, in US, uh, where the uh, children accounts for more than 20% of the pediatric population, only 14% of the COVID cases were in this age group. Now, similar data, we can see it from uh, um, uh, UNICEF, which had gathered the uh, COVID infection uh, data from almost 105 countries. And aggregate, we found that there is almost 16% of the cases are in the 0 to 20 years age group. Now, we can also see that the cases increases as the age increases. The number of children getting infected with coronavirus infection gets more as they get as the age is more of a child. So what we can conclude from this is that, yes, there is children do get infected by coronavirus infection, although majority of the cases and pediatric cases are mild. And the number of children getting infected with coronavirus infection is less in comparison to the adults getting coronavirus infection. However, let's keep in mind that the true incidence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection would be difficult to know in children because of lack of widespread testing. Now, testing has been initially prioritized mainly for the adults and those who have been sick. So maybe a lot of kids who had an infection have been missed during routine testing. Now, the second question we have is, are children uh, with COVID uh, infection get more severe illness or a less severe illness? And are they less susceptible or they have a different immune response in comparison to the adults? Now, if you look at the national and international data, it indicates that hardly two to 3% of children who tested positive for coronavirus infection required hospitalization. So the hospitalization rate in children is significantly less in comparison to uh, the adults. So this just suggests that children may have a less severe illness uh, in comparison to the adults. Now, even if we look at the mortality data, uh, which was aggregate collected from 82 countries published by UNICEF, uh, had shown the mortality rate in children below 20 years to be less than 0.4%. So which is significantly less in compared to the older age group. As the age increases, the mortality rate has increased. Even the data which was published from developing countries like India had shown that uh, of all the total number of COVID cases, uh, only 2% of cases uh, uh, there was uh, death reported. So more than 90% children recovered from COVID-19 infection. So we, we can conclude by this uh, data that uh, the COVID uh, infection in children uh, can lead to hospitalization, but the amount of hospitalization or the rate of hospitalization in children is significantly less in comparison to what we see in adults. Now, this other question we had was, are children less susceptible to the infection of COVID-19 infection? Now, one of the seropositive study, which was uh, done for the children between 10 to 17 years age, showed that the rate is almost similar to adults. 25% of cases. But when we compare to the proportion of the cases which were confirmed to have infection in below 20 years age were quite less. So it, it concludes that children are equally susceptible to the infection, but vast majority of them remain asymptomatic. So they may not be tested many a times. Now, also we have to remember that children were protected in the initial phase of the uh, corona infection also because of the uh, mitigation measures which were taken, especially children when the schools were closed and they were at home. So their exposure to the infection was low. So it would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
thing to observe and see what happens once the all the schools are getting opened. Like what we have seen in UAE now, the schools have opened up. The rate of infections have gone up, but not a, a significant. Uh, still, it remains significantly less in comparison to the adults. And children do have other viral infections in comparison to the corona infection. Now, why children are less susceptible? Now, one of the pathophysiological uh, theory which has been put forward is that children have less expression of ACE2 receptors as well as uh, transmembrane serine protease uh, uh, enzymes expression in the nasal mucosa as well as in the bronchial mucosa. So the lesser the representation or the expression of these receptors leads to less uh, entry of the virus into the endothelium and the respiratory epithelium of the child and thereby resulting in less severe illness in children in compared to the adults. So third question we have is, do all children have same risk levels for COVID-19 disease? Let's look at the facts what are available with us. Yes, all children are capable of getting virus infection uh, from COVID-19 infection, and they do get sick, but less in comparison to the adult. Most of the children have mild symptoms or no symptoms. The main reported risk factor for pediatric population uh, to get infected are usually, you know, the close contact with the uh, some family member who is positive for the infection. So that's the biggest risk factor. So if I tell the risk factors to one, a family member who is positive for infection and child is in close contact with it, or second child is residing in an area where there is large number of COVID cases present at that moment, or child has traveled to such region, which is endemic for COVID infection. The children, especially with chronic conditions such as obesity, diabetes, asthma, are at higher risk of serious infection with COVID-19. Children also who have special medical conditions like congenital heart disease, genetic diseases, metabolic errors, or uh, neurological diseases are also at a higher risk of developing more serious COVID-19 infection. So, Children, uh, all children would not be same affected. The children, especially with the chronic condition, as well as the children with special medical conditions would have more severe illness in compared to the children who do not have those diseases. Uh, the next question we would address is, can neonates get COVID-19 infection from the mother who has COVID-19 infection? Now, if we look into the data, let's, let's first see what are the potential ways where the child can get infection from the mother. So babies can get infection either through uh, when they are in mother's womb, like uh, during intrauterine transmission, that would usually happen from maternal blood to the placenta and then from placenta to the baby. Potential route, these are. The second would be it at the time of peripartum, that's the, at the time of delivery. So when the babies get exposed to the infected maternal secretions or the blood or infected feces, or baby may get infection postpartum, that is after the delivery, maybe through the maternal respiratory droplets or the respiratory uh, droplets from the other caretakers like health workers or other family members if they are infected. And the question mark is, can the breast milk transmit the uh, COVID-19 infection? Now let's look into the data of three possible uh, routes of transmission uh, uh, of infection to the baby. Now, if you look at the studies, you know, studies have, uh, you know, they chose and they, they, they tested several things, including like amniotic fluid, cord bloods, and they took a neonatal swabs at the time of birth to check if they have a possibility of intrauterine infection. And the results of the study showed that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus was negative in all the samples, which I mentioned above, suggesting that there was no intrauterine fetal infection uh, as I asked you the late pregnancy to the mother. So vertical transmission is almost, I would say, not reported till date uh, for the, uh, as a cause of COVID infection in the children. But the point to be remembered is that even though children may not acquire it through the uh, intrauterine time, but they can acquire the infection after they, uh, they come out of the, or after they deliver. So when they are in close contact with the uh, family members or the mother who are positive through inhalation route, like aerosol by coughing of the mother or uh, anybody in the surrounding who is positive for the infection. Should the mothers with COVID-19 breastfeed their babies? Now, let, let, let's look into the data of the breast milk transmission. 
Now, if you look at most of the studies to date, uh, SARS-2 virus has not been detected in the breast milk, at, at least not the uh, infectious uh, in the infectious form. Uh, now, one of the study wherein uh, they took around 64 uh, milk samples uh, 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 of the uh, uh, of the 18 mothers, and then they tested for the uh, you know uh, viable coronavirus. And uh, we did not find any replication of competent virus was detectable in their milk samples. And even those who caught infection after the uh, breast uh, delivery, the rate of infection in neonates was less than 2%, uh, which is significantly less when we compare to the general population. Uh, and even those children or the neonates who had illness the vast majority of them did not have any severe illness, mild symptoms like cold. Some of them were asymptomatic or some had a running nose. So majority of the neonates had a milder illness. So the answer to our question would be breast milk as a source of infection is very unlikely with the available evidence. So we should encourage mothers to breastfeed. Now, what we need to encourage the mother and provide support is to teach them how to do it safely. Like they should practice the respiratory hygiene, wear the mask while feeding, wash the hands before and after touching the baby, routinely disinfect the surface and the equipments which we use while feeding. Now, American Academy of Pediatrics gave three options for the mothers who wished to breastfeed the mothers, uh, breastfeeding mothers after the, for the mothers who were positive for COVID infection. And uh, after delivery, they wanted to breastfeed their babies. The option one was that yes, babies, they can directly breastfeed the babies, but following the instructions, which we mentioned uh, here in the screen before. So uh, here the uh, mother has to follow all the precautions like uh, washing hands before and after wearing masks, uh, uh, routinely disinfecting the surface and the surrounding areas where uh, the mother and the babies are staying. Uh, the only important point to remember is please do not use any face shields or mask for babies. Uh, it can cause accidental suffocations. Babies cannot express themselves or sometimes cannot protect themselves and can lead to sudden infant death syndromes. So no mask for infants. Babies, newborn babies should not wear masks or any shields. The mother who is infected and can be potential source of infection should wear the mask and follow the hygiene methods. The other option which can be given to the mother is if mother wants to uh, not directly breastfeed, but if they, she wishes to give her breast milk, then she, we can do a rooming in practice wherein uh, the baby is kept six feet away from the mother. And mother follows all the same precautions like wearing the mask, washing hands and other routine disinfection and can pump or manually express the milk and then give it to the baby or give it to somebody who can help and who can feed the baby. Uh, here, the important point only to remember, it's better to have a separate pump for the mother and the pump should be regularly cleaned uh, after the use, every after every use uh, in such cases. Uh, if mother goes closer to the baby in less than six feet distance, then it's better she wears the mask. Uh, and the mothers who do not opt to breastfeed, we should encourage them to breastfeed. However, if they take a decision not to breastfeed, we should support them. Uh, how to keep their breast milk, uh, you know, uh, that there should not be a problem to get back on breastfeeding after she becomes negative for the infection. So regular pumping out of milk every two to three hourly and uh, support has to be provided to the mother so that the breast uh, milk uh, uh, production is uh, enough even at the end of the infection. Yeah, uh, the next question is uh, if, uh, uh, the question is that uh, can uh, we have to uh, separate the can the babies if mother is are the babies safe if the mother is uh, negative for the uh, if mother is positive for covid infection so baby would not have any effect as we data what we saw before that there are no vertical transmission so yes the, it could imply that babies are 100% safe but that's not the case babies may not have a direct uh, uh, effect by the uh, uh, corona infection, but there could be indirect effect. Now, let's look one of the study, which was a multi-center study involving 16 hospitals reported the outcome of 242 pregnant women who were diagnosed with COVID infection during their third trimester. And the data was collected between March 13 to May 31st, 2020. Now, in this study, what they did is they monitored the mother and their 248 newborn babies until the age of one month. 
And what they reported in their study was that uh, the mothers who had COVID-19 infection and hospitalized had higher risk of ending up their pregnancy via cesarean section. And the newborn babies of the mothers who had COVID infection and uh, were hospitalized had a higher risk of premature deliveries. So there is an indirect uh, risk to the babies wherein they have a higher risk of being premature or delivered early before time. The same study also showed that no infant had died. There was no vertical or horizontal transmission during the study period. And uh, uh, the, dish, uh, the breastfeeding, uh, exclusive breastfeeding at discharge and uh, at end of one month was almost similar. So if we can conclude that there is a likelihood that uh, if mother is COVID positive infection, then she might have a preterm birth and the prematurity related complications for the babies are more when mother is COVID uh, positive infection and hospitalized. So even though there is no direct risk of infection for the baby, uh, there is significant indirect uh, risk uh, uh, of uh, premature deliveries and related complication in the mothers uh, who had COVID infection and got hospitalized. So uh, the other question which we, we, we would ask to is, should the mother be separated uh, you know, from the babies to protect the baby from mother if she is COVID positive? Now, initially when the uh, pandemic started, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics and various academy had advocated to separate the mothers from the baby. Now, this was based on the practice where uh, from China where you know, the initial cases were reported. And in Wuhan, when the initial cases of COVID happened, uh, the strict policy of separating the babies from mother for 14 days was followed. And similar recommendations were given by other academies all over the world. However, with the uh, increasing evidence that babies uh, are less likely to get vertical transmission and even horizontal transmission rates are less than 2% and majority of the babies has less uh, severe illness, and uh, separating the mother from the baby lead to uh, uh, increase in high number of uh, you know, depression and maternal anxieties. Uh, most of the guidelines now, I would say almost 70% of guidelines all over the world now recommend that uh, uh, mothers and baby should be in the, uh, you know, they can be placed together and uh, they can continue with the breastfeeding safely. However, they should follow the safety precautions. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, question number nine is, do children and adults with COVID-19 have similar symptoms? Uh, well, the answer is no. Uh, 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 although they may have a lot of symptoms which are similar, like fever, cough, cold, breathlessness, shortness of breath, fatigue, myalgia, rhinorrhea, sore throat, or other symptoms, uh, uh, but in children, vast majority of them, they are less severe in comparison to the adults. And children can have a lot more of gastrointestinal symptoms, especially with vomiting, diarrhea, uh, and others. Now, one of the unique conditions which we should mention about children is, you know, we, we have, everybody must have heard now and a lot of things being talked about is, is about multi-system inflammatory disorder, uh, which is typically seen a very, uh, very serious condition, which is seen in children. But I would like you to remember four points about this disease. Uh, first thing is, it's, it's, it's a quite rare disease. It's not something which is very common. It's a rare condition seen in children. Yes, it, it, it usually do not show up during the time of infection, but it shows after few weeks of the COVID-19 infection and uh, it causes inflammation across multiple organs. So multiple organs like heart, lung, kidney, brain, eye, skin or gastrointestinal tracts can be involved and can have a very varied presentation. It can have a very diffuse symptoms. One being like fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea. Some may have neck pain, bloodshot eyes or feel extreme lethargic. Uh, the last question we will try to answer is, uh, do all children, irrespective of the age, require hospitalization if found to have COVID-19 infection? Uh, the answer is no. Not, not all children would need uh, uh, hospitalization for uh, COVID-19 infection. However, children with underlying comorbid conditions, like, uh, you know, they have a neurological, cardiac, hematological, or oncological conditions, then they are more likely to need hospitalization and more uh, uh, care or monitoring for such children. 
uh, even children sometimes less than 12 months age uh, uh, can also require more uh, close monitoring. So they may end up being more hospitalized in comparison to the rest of the children. Um, so children, no, not, not all children need hospitalization uh, uh, if they are COVID-19 infection. In fact, vast majority of them can be managed at home. So thank you, thank you very much. Yes, uh, yeah, we should not forget that uh, it's Corona has uh, been a kind of physical disease, but it also brings a lot of uh, mental health problems. So it is uh, not only for adults, even for the children, uh, we need to provide mental health uh, support for the children to educate them on how to stay safe, healthy, and uh, not be paranoid about the disease. But yes, how to uh, you know, uh, keep yourself safe during the uh, pandemic period. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. Thanks for enlightening us with so much of uh, valuable information. So these are the most frequently asked questions from most of our uh, patients around. And uh, thanks for your valuable information with a lot of statistics. It was very informative. Thank you so much for your uh, information, Doc. And now we uh, uh, take the privilege. I have the privilege to introduce our next speaker for the day. That is our... Uh, <clears throat> Professor Kennedy, who would be talking about children and good health, and uh, he would be talking about the health style, lifestyle. So uh, let me introduce Professor Kennedy, and you all have known because he has been a great part of this entire COVID-19 web series. So Professor Adrian Kennedy is a multifaceted person. In academics, he has degrees in business, law, PhD in health studies from USA, uh, he was founder director of Harvard Institute of Lifestyle Medicine and has been hailed by Harvard Medical School USA as a pioneer in lifestyle medicine. In his college years from 1965 to 1973, he was a national champion of India in 100 and 200 meters and an Asian champion in athletics. He was a member of the team that swam the English Channel from England to France, has trekked in the Himalayas, and is a black belt karate instructor. He was a member of the committee that organized the Asian and Commonwealth Games in India. In corporate life from 1973 to 1990, he was the director of executive health in Tata Steel, where he received the Government of India Award for Sports Management. As managing director Apollo Life from 1990 till 2012, he pioneered in corporate health in India. As Chief Wellness Officer of Rack Hospital Groups from 2012 to date, he has received several awards, including the Best Health Researcher in UAE, Best Wellness Company in GCC, etc. So may I welcome Professor Adrian Kennedy to talk for today's topic. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, I hope you can see me because I can barely see myself on the screen. That's rather dark. Can we lighten up the screen a little bit? Okay, I guess we will do this uh, in a bit of a shadow as I can see over here. Now, friends, when, uh, when I was invited to speak on the subject of health for children, I, uh, I mentioned that besides the PhD that I had in the area of health, my best qualification to speak on the subject was that I was actively involved with my three grandchildren, aged between seven, the eldest, four, the middle one, and three, the littlest one. So that is my major qualification, besides my PhD, for talking about good health in children. Now, there are basically, there are basically just six rules. Yes, 
If we can put that slide up. And while we are waiting for the slide to come up, I will go ahead and mention the rules. There are basically just six rules. There are basically just six rules that I would like you to keep in mind for managing the good health of children. I will take the management of illness last and I will start with robust nutrition. It is important to feed children the right foods in the right quantities. You don't want to give them too much. You certainly don't want to give them too little. And it is equally, if not more important, to ensure that our children have robust physical activity of at least an hour or two every day. Robust physical activity, like running and playing games with other children, etc. Please do not imagine that our children do not have stress and anxiety. They do have stress and anxiety, mainly because they need to keep up and cope with school related activities. Now, while the young ones are immune to dependencies such as alcohol, smoking and drugs, do remember that a parent influences a child and therefore it is essential that parents should not indulge in these activities at home or else you will find that the child will copy this behavior as they grow up. And this is a major hazard for teenage children. Now, when it comes to mortality, children usually do not succumb to illnesses, but the majority of deaths in children is due to injury, especially in teenage children. And finally, management of illness. Please do not take this lightly. Children are small and things tend to aggravate very quickly. So the minute your child gets ill, get on the telephone and call your pediatrician. Now let's talk about each of these little rules one by one. As far as the illness is concerned, the number one rule, please make sure that you have the telephone number of your pediatrician on speed dial. I will give you a good example. Yesterday was a holiday for us in the UAE and I took my grandchildren out swimming. So they were swimming for a couple of hours during the middle of the day and later in the evening, they played with the neighbor's dog. As a consequence, this morning, the littlest one had a running nose. Now, was that a cough and cold? Was it caused by allergy? I haven't the faintest idea. So we quickly called the pediatrician who put all our anxiety to rest. And young children, the little ones, they need the appointment with the dentist, the eye, uh, the, the eye doctor, the ear, nose and throat. Uh, they are minor ailments, but they cause them great discomfort. Now, as children grow up, especially into their teenage years, then we notice body image problems. Children tend to get choosy with the food that they eat. They worry about remaining slim. They watch movies and they watch TV that talks about zero fat and things like this. And therefore nutrition becomes a major issue, especially with teenage girls. And all along, right from the younger ages of three, four, five, right up to the teenage years, anxiety, stress, from scholastic achievements and scholastic pressures often result in the depression, in the child being depressed. So it is vitally important to know 
that you need the support of your pediatrician and your counselor. So children's illnesses are something that we need to take rather seriously. The ailment may not be serious, but it is important for us to alleviate the problem by having the right association with our psychological counselor, with the school counselors, and with our pediatricians. If rule number one is managing the illness of children, then rule number two is appropriate nutrition. Now, this is important, not to say that the previous slide was not, but this is important. The child needs to have a balanced diet. And if I were to talk about this from a technical way, I would simply say that the child must have sufficient protein, carbohydrate, fat, and fiber, which means nothing to a parent. So most simply put, you would like to say that the child, if non-vegetarian, should have sufficient meat. And if vegetarian, then you would replace that meat with vegetable protein, such as beans, nuts, and so on. You must have sufficient vegetable and fruit. This is the pharmacy for the child. It gives them the vitamins and the minerals, and it also gives them fiber. Now the child is full of energy. The child is growing right from birth right up to age 18 or 19. The child is growing and therefore it needs its protein, which will come from meat and other non-vegetable sources. We also need energy. And this energy comes from grain. And you are talking about whole grain. You're talking about multi-grain bread. You are not talking about white bread. You are not talking about refined flour. You are not talking about, about refined rice. You are talking about those natural fibers which give the child energy and also roughage. And then for calcium, strong bones, you need to have dairy products such as milk, eggs, and so on and so forth. Now, do not forget the fruit and vegetables. We've spoken about meat. We've spoken about, can we go back to the previous slide? Yes. We've spoken about meat. We've spoken about uh, uh, calcium. We've spoken about carbohydrate. I now want to emphasize fiber. And this fiber comes from the goodness of fruit and vegetable. And fruit and vegetable gives you your vitamins, A, B, C, D, the entire range, good for the eyes and minerals, etc. good for the bones, good for the muscle, good for growth. So these things are important. Fruits and vegetables added to all the other components. And finally, of all the rules of nutrition, I would talk about just one major rule for children. And that rule is your child must be allowed to eat sufficiently, but equally important is that your child must participate in sports and games activities. This is so important. And while your child is, and while we are on the topic of nutrition, please keep in mind allergies. It is perfectly possible that your child could be allergic to some important things like milk, and then you would need to replace it with soya milk. He could be allergic to grain, to certain forms of wheat. You're talking about gluten. He could be allergic to certain nuts and things like this. So if you notice that your child is getting some, sort, is getting some form of allergies, please talk to your doctor, talk to your nutritionist, and I am sure they will help you to modify the child's diet specific to your needs. Now, rule number one is to keep in touch with your pediatrician. Rule number two is to manage diet. And rule number three is to ensure that the child has some activity. Now, look at the great benefits of exercise, the great benefits. 
It strengthens the child's bones. It improves his circulation. It reduces anxiety. It improves immunity. These are such important benefits that come from the simple activity of playing in the, of the children being active in the playground. And if you take that for, into a technical component, you're talking about stamina, strength, and flexibility. Stamina could come from other activities, including walking, jogging, swimming, cycling, playing games. These are such important activities. They strengthen the child's heart. They improve the child's circulation. They absorb all the stress and anxiety that the child has had in the day. And as our children grow up, they would go to the gym and they would do exercise and that would give them the shape that they require. It would give them the strength that they require. It would give them improved metabolism. And then to control their energy, to reduce their stress, to reduce their anxiety, and to also improve the joint mobility, you have the age-old ancient yoga and calisthenics, free hand exercise movements, which are so important and most important for children. Most important is to play games such as football and cricket and volleyball and basketball and so on and so forth. Not only does it give them, uh, not only does it give them coordination, it also teaches them how to win, how to lose, leadership, teamwork, and all these things are so important. So to wrap it up in a few, in a few minutes to wrap it up, all I will say is make sure that your children play for an hour or two every single day. This rule is as important as eating the right food and having sufficient stress. Now we have something about stress and anxiety. Stress and anxiety, our children will have stress and anxiety and sometimes this stress and anxiety is even more than the stress and anxiety that we adults feel for the simple reason that they have no control over solutions. We as adults have, we have control over solving the problems related to our stress but our children don't necessarily have those capabilities. And therefore, it is important to understand that stress will lead to anxiety and anxiety will lead to depression. Now, where does stress come from? Often it comes from family conflict. It could come from scholastic pressures or it could come from peer group activities. Problems at home, pressures at school and trying to keep up with friends when you don't have the equivalent capacities are things that can cause stress to children. And the effect is anxiety. And that anxiety leads to reduced performance in school, reduced performance overall, the child loses appetite, the child loses confidence, and when the child grows up in the teenage years, we have to be fearful that the child may actually run away, may turn to drugs as a support system. And let us not forget that teenage suicide is a relevant reality. So how do we manage stress? We go back to the structure of games. Physical activity absorbs the home, the stress hormones that are in the body. It absorbs it. The two hours of physical activity will absorb all the stress that the child has. And at the end of the day, the child will come home happy, relieved and relaxed. Exercise, games, dance. I know some of my friends who dance every evening instead of doing exercise. And that is a beautiful way to keep healthy and keep fit. Mentally, allow your children to listen to music. And do not forget the family prayer. When the child prays with the family in the evening to the Almighty and asks for help 
and shows gratitude. This gives the child a sense of comfort that there is somebody beyond his parents looking after him all or her all the time. And never forget that the most important thing for a child is, I mean, a simple statement that we have back home in India, that it takes a village to bring up a child. And then we are talking about family, we are talking about friends, we are talking about the community, we are talking about the teachers. We must all be open to supporting our children in their anxiety and stress. Now, right up to this moment, I have spoken about the physical aspects, but I would now like to spend a minute talking about the mental gym. Mental fitness, who would have ever thought about mental fitness? Mental fitness is as important a reality as physical fitness. So how do we improve these aspects of retention skills, analytical skills, communication, knowledge, problem solving, social skills, so many components that go into mental fitness. How do we improve the mental fitness and the mental health of our children? Retention. Poetry, learning poetry, learning worse is a great way to do it. Analytical skills, mathematicals, two plus two is four. And when my granddaughter asks me, grandpa, what is two plus two? I say 22, which of course is not the correct answer. So analytical skills, two plus two is four. Communication. You get the child to talk at home and to participate in debates, to express themselves in poetry, to express themselves in song. Knowledge. I was sitting this morning with my little child, my little grandchild, and we were watching TV. And on TV, we had uh, the beginning of the universe. We spoke about dinosaurs, and I was amazed that that little seven-year-old knew more about dinosaurs than I would ever know. Problem solving through puzzles and video games with a limitation of time. Remember the rule that the child should not spend more than an hour on TV every day, but educational TV is excellent. Improve concentration by playing interesting games like chess and solving puzzles and social skills by letting the child play with their children. So you have the physical aspects of strength and stamina, and then you have the mental aspects of mental fitness, retention, analytical skills, communication skills, and so on. And now we come to another group, the most difficult group in children, adolescents. We are talking about children from the ages of 13 upwards, the teenage years, sometimes known as the terrible teens. Now, these are difficult years for children. <clears throat> and remember that this is the time when they are more influenced by their friends than they are influenced by their family. And therefore, it is important to choose your family friends well, so that your children are not exposed to the perils of smoking, alcohol, and most importantly, drugs. At this point of time, it is these items that expose your children to automobile accident, injury, and suicide. And you do not want to be a victim of such a situation. So please be very careful about the exposure that your child has to these activities. How do we manage this? By being alive to the situation surrounding your children and their behavior and their friends. Please remember that your school counselor and your psychologist in teenage years is as important as your pediatrician during the childhood years. And remember that the family and friends, and mainly the family, and the parents can be the best support group to your child with love and understanding. 
And finally, we come to this to safety, and I talk about physical safety. Now, the major killer of young people is injury. Older individuals like me will die of some chronic disease, but our younger children who are robust and healthy, most likely will have a fatality from injury. And therefore we must make sure in the UAE, UAE we are fortunate that our rules of road are so robust that our children are largely controlled. But it is so important to ensure that your child adheres to the rules of the road, wears the, wears the helmets and seat belt, and all these other aspects. It is so important. And therefore, I end my presentation, ladies and gentlemen, with two things. One is, to thank Dr. Vishal for his presentation because his presentation answered many questions that I as a grandfather had. I am grateful to know that as far as COVID is concerned, our children have a milder variant. Well, I would say the, the children have a milder, a milder effect or COVID is milder in children, and I'm grateful for that. I'm also grateful for the knowledge that 90% and more of our children will recover. And I add to that statement by reminding my dear colleagues who are listening in and friends who are listening in that the simple rules of good health are one, manage the illness by keeping in touch with your pediatrician, Ensure that your children have the right food in the right quantities. It is so important for our children and grandchildren to play games and have physical activity for growth. Manage stress, be loving, be kind, be understanding. Keep in touch closely with your child's behavior and have your school counselor and psychologist online in case you need it. And remember, look at the picture. He is wearing a helmet, he is wearing his seat belt. It is important that we ensure that our children behave appropriately in their automobiles. And this, ladies and gentlemen, are my six simple rules of keeping our children vibrant, healthy, and growing well. Thank you so much for this opportunity for me to share my thoughts with you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Kennedy. Thank you so much for your input. It was very informative as it's called the six thumb rules for all the parents who really follow it and implement it and have a better lifestyle for all the pediatric uh, people around us. So uh, now may I request and uh, ask Dr. Wilko to ask few questions to the speakers on today's topic. Thank you, Dr. Nitya. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank both the speakers for a wonderful presentation. And Dr. Vishal, you have put uh, all the information so beautifully that uh, we can make a, a handbook for uh, COVID and children. It's so useful uh, information you have given. And we can complement the handbook uh, by professor's uh, lifestyle management thing also, uh, which gives all the preventive measures. So this is very uh, good to be in the information. Now we have received many qu queries, but I'm taking only a few, uh, those are in the query box, the chat box. Uh, one question Mr. Harsah has asked, is it necessary or safe to take vaccines uh, for children? Uh, and second question is that, uh, what can her immunity? Third, he is asking, my sister is nine years old. She is allergic to dust and pollens. Can she take vaccine? So first uh, two questions, I would uh, request Dr. Vishal to answer that. Is it uh, necessary and safe to take vaccine for the children? Yeah. Uh, see, um, uh, there has been a lot of debate going on regarding the vaccination for the children. 
Yes, as we have learned that COVID, fortunately till now, has been uh, less severe and children are less likely to get infection in comparison to the adults. But if you look at the data, children do get infected. And there are yeah. small number of cases which may have a severe disease and there are deaths also reported. So I, won't, I would say that in comparison to adult, it looks smaller, but the problem is still there. So still there. priority when the vaccination started was for the high risk group. So the older age people were given priority while the vaccination started. But now as we have more and more data available with the safety of the vaccine, it is slowly, uh, a, a, all the agencies are going to recommend this vaccines for the children. Of course, it's going to be in the age-wise fashion because we have seen that the risk of infection increases with the increasing age. So it started initially with 12-year-plus kids, then now it's extended up till 5-year-plus kids. And I, I'm sure that uh, in a, a short time, uh, most of the countries are going to introduce the vaccination for children. Yes, vaccines should be done for the children. It does provide protections to the children. Yeah, there may be an argument that children have a milder disease, but still, you never know who might have a severe disease. Right. Thank you, Doc. I would just uh, add one uh, point to this. Is it necessary to take a booster if the, uh, for a children? If uh, children are already having a vaccine for um, COVID, so is it required a booster dose? The booster dose, uh, it's too early to say anything about the booster. The vaccination in children and even the trials in children were started quite late in comparison to what we had done in adults. So we yeah. don't know after a long time how long the immunity is going to last in children. But what we have seen with uh, most of the, uh, you know, uh, mRNA vaccines, that uh, the immune immunity seems to be lasting longer. So now the recommendations for booster has been varied. So ma many of the mRNA vaccines still, they don't recommend booster for healthy adults. It is only for the high risk groups, you know, those with immunocompromised individuals or very old age where there is a very high risk of uh, 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 mortality or I would say severity of the disease is more. Uh, would be recommended for the booster dose. So for children, as of now, we are beginning vaccination. So booster is not something we would talk about it right now. Sure. Thank you, Doc. Uh, second question I would like to ask, uh, Professor uh, will be the best person to answer this. What can we give our children as a supplement and nutrition for the better immunity? Supplements for better immunity. Okay. Yeah. Well, I am a strong believer in natural foods, which means that if you give your children sufficient fruit and vegetable on a day-to-day -day basis, well, then you could certainly cover most of, the, uh, most of the factors that require immunity. Vitamin A is good for the eyes. Vitamin B is good for uh, growth. Vitamin C is good for uh, infection. Vitamin D is good for the bones. Vitamin E is good for fat meta metabolism. Calcium is good for the bones and so on and so forth. Most of these things come from natural foods. However, it is essential for individuals to take supplements in two age groups. And one is in the case of children and two is in the case of older adults. Now for myself, I take supplements on a day-to-day -day basis. And therefore for parents, I would recommend that they also suggest a multivitamin, multivitamin, uh, abdec or some such thing for children. However, I do know that Dr. Wilku only recently picked up a book from here that spoke about nutrition. So I would request Dr. Wilku to supplement my answer by talking about supplements for children. Dr. Wilku. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, definitely very true. Uh, what you have said is uh, uh, perfectly all right. So I will just add to uh, your uh, answer. Uh, Basically, the, see, the, we are talking about uh, vitamins and uh, minerals, and when we talk about the supplement, uh, like uh, Professor has said, natural uh, product make a habit uh, of taking tea and then rich in uh, vitamin E, the, any food which is uh, rich in these. 
vitamin E, C, and B6. So this will be a very good uh, supplement if they have a habit of taking it daily. And when we go to minerals, uh, then we should be uh, advising them to take uh, more of uh, green leafy vegetables and these things. So this will uh, supplement more. So that is the best answer. And in dairy product, yogurt is the best thing. Milk, Professor already mentioned. So this is my answer. Now, next question. No, before I you think, go uh, any further, Dr. Wilku, before you go any further, sir. Dr. Vishal, sir, yes. your thoughts on supplements for children from a yes. medical perspective, both Dr. Wilku and I have spoken about it from a health perspective, but now give it to us, sir, from a medical perspective. We value your opinion. Tell us. Yes, sir. Uh, if I talk about specific with the COVID, there has been a lot of talk about vitamin D, vitamin C, and zinc as an immune booster for the infection. Now, this were all exaggerated or extrapolated from severely ill patients where this was tried as a treatment, and then it became a routine, something which is followed. Now, to add on to the nutrition, vitamin D has shown to have a lot of important role in immune response in the body. So having adequate level of vitamin D is going to ensure a good immune response in our body. Uh, it should not be taken in a very high dose as a treatment dose, but a good healthy food with adequate amount of vitamin D uh, will definitely keep your immune system uh, uh, or immune response against the infections, all kinds of viral infections more apt. Thank, Thank you, you doctor. Much, uh, Thank you so much. I was more wondering about the queries we are receiving. So one more question is there. Uh, my brother has susceptibility to change of weather, catches cold very frequently. Is it safe to have a flu vaccine along with COVID vaccine? They've already yeah. answered, but uh, this question is a little uh, tricky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, the, this question was there even the last year when the pandemic started and the COVID vaccine was about to be, you know, started being given to the people. And uh, at that moment, we were not very sure whether when you do a concurrent vaccine, there are two questions, you know, we have it. First is, is it going to increase the side effects? And second is, is it going to, one vaccine is going to affect the efficacy of the other vaccine? So are they going to compete with the, each other to bring any change in the, uh, in the immune response to the vaccine? Uh, no, but the latest studies have shown that uh, even when we do a you know concurrent or same time administration of uh, COVID and flu vaccination, it has shown that it does not increase any uh, potential side effects uh, in comparison to the people who would have received only one vaccine, and uh, also uh, it doesn't uh, affect with the uh, immune response of each uh, each other. So yes, uh, the current recommendations are yes, both the vaccines can be done at the same time. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question is there, what is the best practice, uh, preventive practice for children? So I think uh, both of you, Dr. Vishal and uh, Professor Kennedy can uh, give their uh, aspect of answers. Yeah, uh, let me start with uh, Professor Kennedy. I would, uh, can I answer? You must, doctor, you must, please. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, see, uh, I, I, we, we hear a lot about preventive things, you know, uh, all those things which have been told, as I told, there's so much of us, you know, all those masks and other things. If you ask me three important things which can prevent COVID infection in children, I would label it in this order. First thing is protect yourself. If we adults get protected ourselves, the chance of children getting infection is going to be very, very low. This is something what we call as family clustering. Vast majority of the children or the single largest risk factors for infection in children was somebody at home having corona infection and being in close contact with the child or in a place where there were a lot of corona infection cases. So if we protect ourselves, children are going to be protected. So that is the first preventive practice we have to do is protect ourselves. Second important thing which works for children very well is hand washing problem here so hand washing frequent hand washing play back home going out to play have two children have to be encouraged to hand wash you know? and if i add up last thing which is important is definitely would be avoid unnecessary gathering or in a, a travel because again this is proven beyond doubt that large gatherings excessive traveling to the places has uh, led to increased number of corona infections. So these are the three important things. Of course, other measures like mask, vaccinations, everything has to be done. But these are the three most important preventive things which we can do. 
And yeah. from my Thank side, you, uh, Dr. Wilco, from my side, to add to the specificity of Dr. Vishal's uh, uh, elucidation on what we, what our children need to do to keep COVID at bay, I would talk about health and immunity. So what should our children do? I've already mentioned that the most important number that any parent can have is the number of our pediatrician. And I'm sure we would make available Dr. Vishal's number abundantly to everyone. Okay, that's the number one rule. Now, the second, appropriate nutrition. Please ensure that our children eat the right foods in the right quantities at the right time. Nutrition is so important, not only for immunity, but also for growth. The third important rule is activity. The body is a machine like any other machine and the joints have to be lubricated. The more you feed the body, the more the body will grow. You have to make sure that you have at least one or two hours of physical activity. Now that will not only teach, that will not only help the child to grow big and strong, but will also give the child many characteristics that are required to manage anxiety, stress and depre depression. That's another aspect. And then keep an eye on your children as they are growing up to ensure that they are with the right groups and have the right friends. A loving, understanding relationship. So I would say, keep in touch with your doctor, Children must eat the right food. Children must do some exercise activity. We must be loving, kind, and understanding to our children in order to avoid the problems of dependency and drug dependence and safety. Those are my rules for good health and immunity. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there are many questions which will be, uh, which is already being answered by uh, Dr. Vishal and Professor both. So we will be replying that individually on the mail. But I would like to take one more question, which is very important. Mr. Bharat is asking, uh, my brother is asthmatic and he is on an antihistamine. Can he take a vaccine? Dr. Vishal. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, as, as we discussed, you know, even in children as well as in adults, asthma itself is one of the biggest risk factors. Uh, asthma does cause increased in uh, AC2 and, uh, you know, transmembrane protein expression increase. So they, they may are, they are more likely to have severe uh, illness with COVID infection. So prevention would be the best strategy. So yes, uh, the, uh, the, all the patients who are asthmatic should receive vaccine actually in, in a priority group. Antihistamines have uh, nothing to do with the vaccine. So even if they are taking concurrent medications of asthma or antihistamines, Till they can go ahead with the vaccinations. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, just to add on one thing, because I yeah, saw sure. certain polls and other and so many questions. Yeah, yeah, so that just, is what uh, I was. A lot of question ask, about yeah. the vaccine. So let, let me yeah. give one uh, blanket thing. Uh, everybody can have vaccine. There is no contraindication of having vaccine. The only contraindication of having vaccine is if you have a severe life-threatening allergic reactions uh, to any of the allergen, then you would be very careful before you take the vaccine. Or second would be if you are on an active immunosuppressive treatment, like active uh, high dose chemotherapy treatment or uh, somewhere where your immune system is suppressed significantly, only in such conditions uh, you would uh, discuss with your doctor and then take a decision whether you do the vaccine. Other than that, mild allergies, mild medications, pregnancies or breastfeeding, there's no contraindication of doing a vaccine. In fact, even breastfeeding mothers should take the vaccine. It is giving indirect protection to the babies against COVID-19 infection. Yeah, thank you. I was going to take that question also. So thank you, uh, Dr. Vishal. So rest questions, what we received in the email, we'll be answering them uh, with your information and professor's input. So we'll answer the questions. Uh, and for now, uh, I would uh, take a rest. Professor Kennedy, uh, Dr. Uh, Nitya, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Velku. Thank you for assisting all our uh, questions and most of our questions have been answered. So on behalf of RAC Hospital and Arise, I would like to express a great uh, thank you and gratitude to our great speakers today, Dr. Vishal Mehta and Professor Kennedy. Uh, and a valuable thanks for giving us such a lot of information about COVID and how COVID is uh, uh, prevalent and how to prevent uh, COVID.
from uh, our pediatric, for pediatric patients. And uh, for the entire team, I would like to thank the uh, friends from the IT and Arabian Wellness for helping us to put this program together and making it a good one once again. Thank you all. Thank you for joining and giving us your precious time and uh, making this webinar a successful one. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.